Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for clicking on the video as always. It is the last weekend of August. This is Saturday. Tomorrow is actually the 1st of September, which is the first day of meteorological autumn. And uh, I'm starting to feel that relief for the end of summer coming. If you followed me for a while, you know that I, I just don't enjoy the summer season at all. I think the way I feel about summer is the way that a lot of people feel about winter, strangely enough, but I definitely feel more relaxed when it comes to the sort of cooler, uh, quieter months of the year. But actually, summer this year has been a non-starter throughout probably most of the UK, but especially in the, the northwest of Scotland. For this trip, my setup is it's very overkill, to be honest. I've got the Pomoli stove hut, which is the uh, hot tent that you saw me use a couple times last year. I'm not gonna be using it as a hot tent, but the nice thing about it is it's got the, the porch, like the front opens up. It's got a big screen uh, for the midge. And I did actually get out and use that setup throughout the summer once, and it was actually very comfortable, so I was keen to do it again. So yeah, if that interests you, please stick around, and I hope you enjoy the video. So that's the tent pretty much set up, uh, but as I mentioned, it's got this kind of porch awning, whatever you want to call it, system where the front lifts up and the tent actually comes with these awning poles. I don't know if you can see that or not. And uh, extra guy lines as well. And it's really simple. It just hooks onto the top and you just tie it out. These poles come with the tent. But of course you could just use a couple of sticks as well, it'll work just the same if you want to cut down on the amount of stuff you're carrying. And also there's a couple of poles for inside the tent as well. But there's loops on top where you can use a ridge line instead. I've got a couple of bits of new gear with me. I got a, a pretty full um, package of stuff sent to me from Solonac. Yeah, they sent me this knife. We're coming a bit closer, which is a bit of a, a bit of a beast. Very lightweight, nice, uh, nice rubber grip, nice weight to it, and it's even got. Uh, I don't know if you can see that a kind of serrated section on the spine which is absolutely fantastic for either the, the fire steel you know getting a lot of sparks from that or even if you've got some fat wood or even normal wood where you want to make some very fine shavings to get the fire going that's that's really useful yeah and then we've got this uh i'm not quite sure how to say it it's plancha pan plancha plancha i don't know it's a stainless steel pan and it's got a suspension system which I'll show you in a minute with the tripod but it also has the option of just using these legs and standing it straight over the fire and it really does take seconds they just push in like that and that's it they just clip into these little bits here and that holds them. Really big sized pan, very lightweight as well. Like I say, easy to store. Get this tripod put together and then I'll, I'll show you the, the, the pan suspended properly. Right, so I've got just these three lengths of wood here. Pretty simple. Cut them all to the same size. I've just cut a bit of a, uh, a notch um, so the paracord doesn't slip and I'm just gonna I think it's wrapping and frapping is the technical term. I'm gonna put a, a bowling knot on one end and then just start wrapping it. 
going to put this loop end over one of the pieces. Put it down into that notch that I made. Hold the sticks together. Just wrap them a couple of times. And then we're going to go in between. And you just start to wrap it or wrap it around the wraps, if that makes sense. I'll try and hold it so you can see it. So that starts the tension down that way as well as, as that way. Like that. Just move them out into tripod shape, hopefully you can see that. Now we've got this length in the middle. I might make it a little bit shorter because I don't need that much. Not too much though. I'm just gonna melt the end so it doesn't fray. And then I'll just get like a little toggle. Actually, I'll get that just now and I'll bring you back in a second. And then this is the suspension system for the pan. And you can just slip that through like that. And then that'll sit like that without, uh, or hopefully without falling off. just has these little metal bars that clip in and that's it very quick and easy now could I have cooked the same food on a pan straight on the fire yes is it as much fun absolutely not but one thing this does give the advantage of is you can obviously suspend it over the fire and adjust it if you want to cook something sort of uh, for a long time, you know, gradually, that kind of thing, rather than that kind of fast cooking right on the fire. Let's go see if we can find some mushrooms. So these are chanterelles. I've spoken about them on the on the channel before. A fairly common forest mushroom, especially uh, in kind of northern temperate forests and up in Scandinavia and the Boreal as well and we've got a few here there'll be enough for me I, I just need a couple of handfuls for dinner tonight I'll leave the rest um, it's always best not to take every single one that's here or there's just going to be less the following year
Oh, there we go. Right, this is starting to look and smell pretty good to be honest. So I think I'm gonna call that done and serve some up and eat it. Oh, that is delicious. I just thought I would try cooking something a bit more interesting than a steak. I mean, you can't go wrong with a steak, but you've seen me do it so many times now. <sighs> oh. <clears throat> I just finished the whole lot. Oh, that was really good. Hmm. Right guys, that's 10 o'clock now. I think I'm gonna call it a night there. I'll let this fire die down a bit and then uh, get into the sleeping bag. And uh, I'll hopefully see you in the morning. Morning folks, just getting some coffee on here. Another really nice morning actually. It was about six or seven degrees this morning, so feeling quite fresh and um, autumnal, I guess. And it's the first of September today, so definitely starting to feel a, a change in the season. Right guys, I'm going to call it there. I've had a pretty nice, relaxed morning, but I'm going to get packed up now and head out. Thanks for watching, as always. If you want to stick around for Forest Thoughts, please do. But if not, hopefully I will see you on the next one. Hi folks, thanks for sticking around for Forest Thoughts. You may have noticed that in some of my videos I like to incorporate a bit of the, the Gaelic language and there's a couple of reasons why I do that. First reason is that culturally I think it's important to keep these languages alive even if it's in just you know little ways like I'm doing in my videos. And secondly, I think the Gaelic language is, is a vital tool 
in helping us in the process of restoring Scotland's native woodland and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. So for those that don't know, Scottish Gaelic is a traditional native language in Scotland. It's a Celtic language and it originated from Old Irish and it was actually brought to Scotland by settlers around the 5th century. And it was the dominant language spoken in probably the majority of Scotland at one point, but very much in the, the Highlands and the Western Isles, right up until the 12th century. Since the 12th century, the use of Gaelic has declined because of various changes, like the, the introduction of uh, English, which started to become the dominant language in Scotland. There's lots of political changes around that as well, but there were still many Gaelic speaking communities, especially across the north of Scotland, right up until around the time of the Highland Clearances. Now the Highland Clearances are a massively complex and culturally sensitive historic event in Scotland and it didn't just affect this country, it really did have repercussions all around the globe. And right now is not the time or the place to get into that uh, detail but I would encourage you to read about it if you have the time but essentially after the Battle of Culloden the British government forces forcibly removed a lot of the Highland people from the land replaced a lot of them with sheep and pretty much did everything within their power to try and erase any and all Gaelic culture and heritage and if I'm honest, it's probably one of the main reasons why Scotland's natural landscapes and its system of land ownership is the way it is today. Now I'll stop myself there before I get too deep into that side of this topic, but fortunately the Gaelic language has been able to survive and we still see its influence in Scotland today. Now if you open up an OS topographic map for Scotland today, especially for the Highlands and Islands, you'll see thousands and thousands of Gaelic names for towns, villages, lochs, mountains, rivers, and pretty much everything in between. Many of those names have been anglicized and bastardized over the course of history. And a lot of that was to do with the, the cultural suppression that I just mentioned. But at the same time, a lot of the names have survived. Now, the Gaelic language itself is very descriptive and it's deeply intertwined and connected with nature and the natural landscapes around us. And although to a lot of people, these Gaelic names might just look a bit odd or a bit funny. They're actually very accurate descriptions about those points within the landscape. And that description could reference uh, maybe a notable person in the area, some kind of story behind that area, uh, you know, like a local historical event, or What's more interesting for me personally is it's some kind of description of the natural landscape. I'm not a Gaelic speaker by any means. I'm not fluent in the language at all, but I have taken a keen interest in the language because of that very point about its connection to nature. For example, if you take the names in Gaelic for some of our most common native uh, tree species and then you go and open the maps again and start looking it adds just a whole extra level of interest when you're interpreting these maps now i love looking at maps and the detail on maps at the best of times but say you go and learn the gallic names for uh, pine birch and oak very quickly you start picking those names out all over the landscape in Scotland and not only does it show you what could still be there but more importantly it shows you 
the scale of just how much we are now missing in terms of woodland. And that brings me on nicely to the main point of Forest Thoughts today and that's to, to mention a, a project that's just been recently publicised called Forgotten Woods. And Forgotten Woods is a collaborative project between uh, Nature Scott, Forestry and Land Scotland and some other Gaelic language uh, organisations and individuals. And what they've done is they have scoured all sorts of different um, resources and sources of you know uh, information on Gaelic language and they've created a, a map of Scotland and on that map are all the points that reference uh, forests or trees or woodland or some kind of uh, you know wood based uh, industry you know maybe uh, tanning or charcoal production this kind of thing and they've essentially given us a snapshot of the past in terms of Scotland's native woodland and I feel like the the project is, is an incredibly important one because it does it's, it's a direct link to evidence of of what we're actually missing today you know we we struggle to think about what Scotland would have really look like and visually that's still quite difficult to do but you have people who were there and saw it and essentially recorded all those descriptions and we have access to them today uh, and like I say that that map is now accessible by the public uh, there's a whole website to go with the project it's got um, kind of stories and more information as well as the map and I'll leave a link to that below. I'll also leave a couple of links to different sort of Gaelic language uh, resources if people are interested. I would I would encourage you to go and have a look. You know, learn a few words, learn you know, learn the Gaelic names for some of our most common species, and just go and look at some maps of Scotland and just have a bit of fun with it. But I think you'll be surprised just how many mentions of uh, sort of trees and woodland there are in landscapes where you'll struggle to find a tree at all these days okay that's it for this one thanks for listening as always as i said i'll leave the the links to some of the things i've been talking about and some of the gear i used in the main video in the description below and i will hopefully see you on the next one